I'm Sean. I'm Laura. And I'm Alice. We're a theatre company of three, telling stories around the whole country. But now we're stuck at home, with just a microphone. Welcome to Stories from the... Wait. Okay. One, two, three, four... Welcome to Stories from the Sticks, brought to you by Scratchworks Theatre Company. Whilst we can't be on the road, we're bringing stories from the road to you. Episode 1, Eddie. Hi! Hi. <laughs> Hello! So nice to be nice here. Nice to see your faces. <laughs> Hello, we're Scratchworks. That one's Sean. Oh, I'm Sean. Hi. <laughs> that one was Alice. I'm Alice, yeah. Yes. And that one, say Hello. Hello. That's Laura. Hopefully <laughs> people will start to recognise the different voices as we go on. I feel like they're um, quite um, recognisable enough. Until we start doing our weird accents and then it all goes out the window. <laughs> Who's this? Fourth member. <laughs> Scottish <laughs> Jane. <laughs> Hello there, Art. I'm just come down from down under. It's Deborah. <laughs> We thought uh, we would give you a little bit of pre-ramble about what this is you're about to listen to. What is this they're about to listen to, guys? Yeah, this is a brand new creative venture for us. You know, we're theatre makers and that's what we've been doing for the last six years. But it's been locked down and the whole creative industry has been turned up on its head. And how we make and tell stories, we suddenly had to be pretty inventive and and try new things so this is us trying something brand new um and in this podcast the main thing we wanted to do was was connect with people and put their stories on the platform for the first time what do you guys think i think it's going to be really nice Mm. we're talking to people from rural communities uh we tend to do a thing called rural touring rural touring is A wonderful creation where professional performances of all of all kinds. Could it be theatre? It could. It could be I realised I started a question. (laughs) I I thought you were doing a thing. (laughs) Alice's practice. Could it be circus? It could. (laughs) It could be circus. It could be music, poetry, mime. It could be any of those things. <laughs> I'd love to see. I really want to see some mime now. So you'd usually expect to find a theatre company in a theatre. But for the last four years, we've been doing a bit of a mixture, including something else, which is known as rural touring, which is where we take our theatre shows to very small villages and towns in very rural locations. Most of them don't have train stations. They might have one bus service a day. And it's basically bringing professional arts into the heart of the community because these people don't necessarily have access to a big theatre venue close by. They can't just hop on a train and go to a big theatre. So it's making the most of the community spaces that there that exist already, village halls, sometimes churches, um, all sorts of, of spaces. And we take our performances to them. And what's really wonderful is... Um All these people that we meet, that we get to have a drink with after the show, they have so many stories and so much to talk about with their village and their life. Um, So we decided to bring those stories to you. So let's get on to the main event and (gasps) you guys can stop listening to us. Why did you gasp? It's so exciting. (laughs) I got a tingle of excitement. (laughs) (laughs) Sorry. This week, I'm interviewing Eddie from Dalton. Hello, this is Laura here. I hope you're doing okay. Today, you meet Eddie from the bubbly rural village of Dalton in Devon. We visited Dalton a couple of years ago with one of our shows. Eddie was our host for the day and such a character. 
to be honest, the whole of Dalton has a character. Their community spirit is like a cheeky smile that you can't help but find infectious. Someone will throw an arm around your shoulder and invite you to the pub, even if you're just in town for the night like we were. This village is a no-nonsense, get-the-job-done kind of place. It's a village of carnivals in the rain, giant cakes and big celebrations. It is Wednesday the 20th of May, about two o'clock in the afternoon. It was quite warm and week nine of lockdown, I think. Of course, due to social distancing, our conversation took place on Zoom. Sometimes the quality of the call is less than perfect. But if you can tolerate the occasional blip, Eddie's wonderful stories will be your reward. Wherever you are, I hope you enjoy them. Here is Eddie. All right then, it's lovely to speak to you, Eddie. Um, So my first question is just for our listeners, if you could describe where you are at the moment. Oh, in my sitting room, (laughs) in Hector's clothes, in Dalton. Beautiful village, very nice people. We get entertained by some lovely acts, like yourself. Oh, thank you. <laughs> uh, and that's where I am. And is it a nice day today? Beautiful day. Absolutely. Mm. Woke up to not a cloud in the sky, and there still isn't. So it's fabulous. Don't get that, that much in North Devon. It's known for being quite damp a lot of the time. But, uh, yeah, we're in a really nice spell at the moment. If you were a mode of transport, what would you be? Me? A motorbike. Why would you be a motorbike? <laughs> because I love motorbikes. I know I haven't rode one for 50 years, but we used to be bikers in our youth, you know, back in mods and rocker days, really. Amazing. Where were you a <laughs> motorbike modern rocker? Where was I? South East London. Yes. Um, and uh, we used to go, oh, be quite a big hang of us really you know and we used to go to different places not not trouble spots like you probably heard about in the old days mm-hmm. um, but we used to go to brands hatch which is a racing circuit and we had, there was a a motor a, not motorway cafe um a biker's cafe on the old a20 which was called johnson's and uh, we used to congregate there most nights of the week really um so you got all these bikers would turn up and look at each other's bikes and go in, have a coffee all night and that sort of stuff. And uh, in fact, that was probably my last memories where I had quite a serious bike accident leaving there one bank holiday because it was one of them roads. I don't know if you know, where could I say there's another road on the Ilminster bypass. It's like three lanes and uh, they had, a lot of the roads used to be like that. There weren't many children carriageways and we left the one off the other leaving Johnson's on our bikes and a mate of mine went off. He had a sidecar. And, uh, and his bike, and it was a souped up bike anyway. And he went pouring off. Then my cousin, they, they went off afterwards, and then I went off. And given it full throttle, and the bikes we had in them days were clubman bikes, and they was not as fast as today's bikes, but they was geared up so you could do sort of 70 in first gear, unbelievable. I went to my second gear and winding it wide open. Bank on the left, bike pulled up in this um, little bit of green. I was, combination bike thought it was our mate so I looked around realized it wasn't I'm still full throttle my cousin in front had looked as well but he shut his bike down and I went right up the back doing about 80 85 oh mile an my hour goodness I know and we bounced along the road and um, lucky enough it was bank holiday there was cars go each way but we all survived that quite without too much damage really so that was probably more or less when I stopped doing it really oh. been a bit of a Wild biker in my day. Do you miss Way it back. now? Yeah, I'd love to be able to do it now when you see open roads and bikes just whizzing along. Freedom, you've got more freedom than you've got in a car. So how long have you lived in Dalton for? Since 1983. You can work that out. I can. I, can. I won't do the maths right now, but I can. So maths on the spot is clearly not my strongest point. I'm sure you've worked out already that Eddie has lived in Dalton for 37 years. And why did you move to Dalton in the first place? 
got fed up with life in the southeast. We basically it was the, the be all and end all of it. We lived, I lived in, brought up in southeast London, got married and moved out into Kent. So we moved to the first house was down on a place called the Isle of Sheppey. Funny place on North Kent. Yeah, so stayed there two or three years, then moved to a little place called Hempstead, right by Medway Towns, which is uh, Rochester, Strew, Gillingham, Chatham. That's one big area. And we lived in a little village about the size of Dalton, as it was then. We lived there for two different properties. We moved from one side of the village to the other because they started building thousands of houses and shopping centres and our beautiful valley we used to have. So we moved to the other side of the village, which was the same. We had a lovely long garden and uh, there were all trees and things at the back. We had access to a field. Of course, we had a pony for my daughter at the time <laughs> and oh, for a long time. And uh, then they started building there. So, and I was working for a company. Uh, I'd really had enough of it. I was working long, long hours, lots of responsibility for, oh, we nearly swore then, very poor pay. <laughs> <laughs> We've got the edit, it's fine. <laughs> uh, so, and then I thought, I don't know, I've had enough of all this. Let's just get out of it. You know, we've been to Devon a few times in our holiday times. And my mother was a Devonian. Really? Right? Because we had, my mother was one of 11. She was the middle one. So all the ones prior to her were born in Plymouth because her mum and dad, my nan and granddad, um, he was a farrier in the army and he was based in Plymouth. So consequently, and he married... We're never sure if my grand was Devonian or um, Cornish. We're not really sure about that. Anyway, she, they married and then, of course, they had uh, a big family. But up to my mum, they was all born in Plymouth area. So it's like coming home in a way. Yeah, I guess there's probably been no regrets, I would imagine, in the different None lifestyle. The only regrets I have, when I go back up there to visit family and things, getting back is couldn't get back quick enough really <laughs> it is a nightmare living in them places now yeah um, i'm sure it, it was um quite a change when you decided to move yeah it was yeah well move basically we got a place in just outside dalton about a mile outside mm. and it was to sort of lead the good life if you like there's a couple of acres with it and we had the pony we had dogs and all this sort of stuff so we came down and i thought oh i won't work so hard People found out what my job was, because um, I worked for a guy for a year. It went completely flat, his business. He had six guys working for him, and it, it just dried up. Which He said, so we have to lay you off for, well, for, until work picks up. It didn't really pick up. I didn't mind, because I'd bought this old wreck of a place that could barely live in it, and been lived in for two years. There was not much running water, or not probably sanitation and all that stuff. When you used to jump in, the, have a bath of a night, you used to get a tingle because the electrics weren't right. You'd get oh, no. an electric shock. <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> anyway, um, when the wind blew in the winter, it used to blow the tiles off the roof. You know, big old tiles. I used to have to go out and put them on for it to work. Anyway, I didn't mind not having much work because then I had time to do the place up. You know, but people found out what I did and who I'd worked for. With it. He had a good reputation, really. And it just took off. So, I ended up working a damn sight harder than I intended or what I did before. Mm. And you were a plumber, was that right? Yeah, plumbing and heating, yeah. How was it being the, the village plumber? It sounds like you're in high demand. I enjoyed most of it, yeah. It became a social job, really. It was quite nice. I mean, I wasn't only in Dalton. I, I got spread quite a long area mm -hmm. on reputation, you know. Yeah. And uh, mainly it was a social work. And one of the funniest things... In more recent times, when Jean and me get together, and my wife now, yeah, uh, we got together, I don't know, 15 years ago, or no, a bit more than that, really. And uh, she's at my place down here, where not where I live now, but down in the village. And uh, people used to ring up and say, Oh, uh, uh, I've got Eddie on Eddie's urgent job. Tell him I've just baked a cake, which was a temptation for me to go. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, yeah. It used to be a nuisance going out in the evening down a pub because people <laughs> always talk to you about their plumbing. But now, where you go in the world, and when they say, Oh, what do you do for a living? You meet somebody on a plane going to Timbuktu or somewhere. So, what do you do? Oh, can you, I've got a plumbing problem. Oh, what can I tell me about this? And I even sure. had it. I had the knee operation, right, a few years ago. Mm -hmm. And when I, was, I went into 
was it Neil? No, Carpool Tunnel. I had a Carpool Tunnel thing. You get these little things in, you get older. And uh, when I went into the into the North Devon Hospital, and they take you into the um, not the operating field, but the pre-op in there, and they um, <laughs> do all these silly things. Anyway, he said, "Oh, what do you do for a living?" Plumber. Ah, oh, the surgeon says to me, "I've got a tap problem. Can you sort sort of?" Talk me through my problems. I said, I've come about my hand, you know. Yeah, oh, you poor <laughs> thing. Well, it's not a poor thing. It's just how it is. It's almost like being a policeman. You never want to yes. tell them what to do. Don't talk to me when I'm down a pub. Send me a message on my answered phone or whatever. Because I won't remember. I'm down enjoying myself. I won't remember what you're talking about. And I never did. No. Yeah. Absolutely. The pub is a sacred place. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'd like to go to one now. Mm, oh, don't we all? Definitely miss yeah. going to pubs at the moment. How's Dalton been in lockdown? Yeah, awful. Yeah, awful. Just missing our friends, really. We, we, oh, where we live, we're quite lucky. Just next door, we've got a good friend, neighbours, we can socialise over the fence we're all around us so mm -hmm. we're quite lucky living a little close and we can social distance quite easy we can go out for lots of walks here which is fine because you don't hardly see a soul you might see the odd person or two people in the country and there's so many walks here you can go on different ones all the time and what we have found there's a book of Dalton walks actually for your interest one day yeah. um, when you're walking across fields here and in because it's usually very wet in North Devon the fields are so dry and the gateways that you never want to walk through because it comes up over your boots are all bone dry so you can do various walks that you wouldn't normally bother to do because you know you're gonna get covered in mud and we've got an amazing shop our little stores he's, he's been absolutely brilliant we, we haven't been out of the village to buy anything we got a butcher's and we've got a general store with a post office and we, we he's been brilliant about self you know keeping people yes. distant in letting one at a time in the shop lucky enough it's been dry we haven't had to queue in the rain yeah <laughs> so, so do you think as a village dalton will have changed much when it comes out of lockdown not a lot really i don't no. think no no i don't think so no i mean people are still uh, communicating they've got a Dalton Facebook site which I don't go on but Jean looks at it mm -hmm. um, lots of people they, they've done loads of stuff right because um, they've got a, um, a seed swap and a plant swap things going on like that so people are contacting each other we'll leave them on your doorstep or we'll leave them on a chair and then you go and do that and that sort of thing there's lots of that sort of stuff going on especially like everywhere else when you do the Thursday night clap or ring a bell and for the, for the services, which is great. I've got a very noisy bell, I've got to say. Jesus. Really? <laughs> on, oh, I can't reach it. It's, it I won't do it because it is very loud. Oh, you bell. ring a bell yourself. Amazing. <laughs> oh, I've got lots of weird, because I, I had a carnival. I usually do a carnival folk when we have a carnival, and I, I like to draw people's attention. <laughs> I'm intrigued. A carnival? Uh, yeah. Is this a village a carnival? carnival. Yeah, the carnival always the first Saturday in November is Dalton Carnival. Okay. Usually wet, very often cold, and I, all the time I was working, I never had time to take part in it because my job being plumbing and heating from sort of oh, end of October, end of August, right through to Christmas, everybody wants their bathrooms done, their heating done, and all that stuff. So I never had time to do it. And then the year I decided I was going to retire, which was just beyond retirement age. Uh, I thought, I'm going to do a float. So a mate of mine who's a farmer had a little trailer. So we've got this trailer. And I don't know if you know, we've got one of the Rolling Stones lives in Dalton. I didn't uh, know that. Amazing. Charlie Watts, the drummer, right? And wow. I've done lots of work for him. In fact, I'm probably the only person in his life that he's made tea for. He's made me a teaser because <laughs> they're so pleased to see a plumber when they're in trouble. They're, yeah. Right? Does he make um, a good brew? No, it was quite good, yeah. I had two. Good. I had another one like mm, yes. <laughs> <laughs> so I knew he had some stuff he's got. He's got a few, not a massive house, not a mansion. It's like a, an in-between size place. And he, mm. they, um, his wife's into horses in a big way. They've got um, 
Arab horses started off with about 60 acres. They now got about 600 acres. They've been buying up land. And if you come up around the backs of Dalton, every field, you'll see Arab horses in them. They're everywhere. Um, I'm, I forgot what I was going to say in the first place. You're oh, talking about, about the because, carnival, yeah. Yeah, yeah well, I, I knew that in one of his old barns up there, he had a, a, a big bath. So I went up and saw him. He said, yeah, of course you can take it. So it's one of these great big cast iron baths. And, stuck it on the back of the trailer with a bit of help and put all the stuff all around it. And I call myself the retiring plumber, <laughs> double meaning. <laughs> Did you get it? <laughs> I don't know oh. if I do. No. <laughs> the retiring plumber. Yeah. So I was going to retire. Yeah. Or was I? And I was retiring in a bar. Oh, um, I see. Oh, wonderful. <laughs> oh, I bet they uh, love that. I've got a sort of a sumo thing out, so outfit, so it didn't look like I have anything on. <laughs> my friends would give me a, a shower cap, so I had that on it, and I was roasting because it had lights all shining on it. There's a fuzzy connection, there's delay on the phone, yet we're still talking car. We feel less alone Joining words and pauses Laughter and phrases I will chat with you even If it takes ages Jabbering and jiggling Until I need a wee Or until I'm down to 1% of batter What has been a memorable event in the village? Several um, celebrations to do with the royalty, really. Mm -hmm. Silver Jubilee, that was 77, that was before I come here. But the next year, the Golden Jubilee, yeah, that was when it, the giant, all the ladies, they used to have a W.I., they didn't have it anymore. But, and they made down in the square a huge, huge cake so everybody in the village could have a slice of cake. At that time, I was actually living on my own down in London part of the village and um, but I had lots of sort of elderly neighbours that never went up there so I went up and got all of them a slice of cake and took them round to them you know so that was one of the memorable ones what was the other big celebration one one was when we raised the money for the new church bells Dalton church bells hadn't rung for many years and that was before uh, before the millennium and we raised £28,000 in this little village to pay for the re, the bells to be rehung or whatever you call them. I can't remember the title now. And the structure up in the church to be refixed. And so we could have our bells ringing for the millennium. Wow. So that was quite a big event. Yeah, um, quite an achievement. Unfortunately for a mate of mine who lived next door to the church, <laughs> and he hadn't yes. lived there when they rung before, he rung me up after they started ringing. And he, heard, he said, hold your phone up. He said, listen to this. He had his phone outside. He thought, and the, the bells, his six bells, were going like the clappers. He said, I didn't believe this would happen since I moved here. <laughs> <laughs> and so did you meet Jean in Dalton? No, we'd known each other since she used to do my mum's hair in London. And then six years ago, we got married. Did you have your wedding locally? A big village wedding. We got loads of CDs and stuff. It was amazing what the people in this village did. And, uh, oh, Christ, oh, we'll get me going. It was um, very emotional. I found um, emotional now too. Yeah. <laughs> Gosh, it sounds extraordinary. We, we done it in the village hall. Yeah. And we got some people locally who had marquees and everything and used to be able to rig them all out. So they've done a wonderful job for us in there, which we had to pay for that people done all the cutlery and all that but when we went to the church it was full and had a choir singing it was a local all the choir sung and they decked all the church out it was around easter time so it was being decked anyway and it was oh gosh it was and the local blokes got some old rose voices so we had an open top rose voice to go from our church about 100 bloody yards <laughs> to the village hall reception you know. mm. yeah it was a while of a do really and we had a, a live band and yeah, it was fantastic. Yeah, that sounds beautiful. Absolutely beautiful. That was the biggest event in my village life. Yeah, I believe that. I'm not surprised. It sounds extraordinary. Yeah.
If you could walk around your village and you had some headphones in and we could be playing any music to listen to, any piece of music or any song, what would you like to listen to when walking around your village? It wouldn't be peaceful, that's for sure. I know really? It's a peaceful village. <laughs> no, I'm a rock and roller, big and time, you know, Rolling Stones and Chuck Berry and that sort of era is me, big time. Yeah. Um, and Jeff Barker's rock and roll show on a Devon on a Saturday, Sunday night. I don't know if you, ever, you wouldn't even listen to that, but they move. It's one of my angry things. It used to be a Saturday night thing from six o'clock till eight o'clock. We played all local, old stuff and new stuff, all rock and roll stuff. Then they moved it to Sunday night, six o'clock to eight o'clock. Now it's after nine o'clock that he might be on for five minutes. Oh, no. Yes, they get letters from me. I get so angry about this. <laughs> I'm not the only one. It was our part enjoyment. Really, trying to shove us out the window for the younger ones coming in. I don't know. Mm. Anyway, you also enjoy it. Yeah, yeah we, love, we like rock and roll. She likes dancing. I like driving. We go to Rhythm and Blues weekends a few times a year, which is mm. great. And uh, and we have I run or had run for quite a few years the Dalton Dance, you know, before Christmas. Um, but the year before last, yeah, I gave it up because we had um, we'd done a Blues Brothers band, right? It was quite a story of that. Blues Brothers band coming up, part come from Plymouth and part Mexico, and it was a nine piece band, which was great. And everybody to dress up with their little pork pie hats and dark glasses, you know, the Blues Brothers? Yeah. No. Yeah, you do. Yeah, well, yeah. yeah, that's what it was. It was a great band, had a bit of a few issues getting here. One of their vans broke down. They rung up, one van come one way and the other one, and he's the one with all the equipment on. And he, wrote, he rung up the hall for one of his mates on the phone and he said, um, um, the van's broke down. I don't know where I am. It's pitch black in the middle of the country. <laughs> so I said to the bro, I'll talk to him and try and talk him through where he might be. So we, we found out where he was in the end. So they went and picked it up for him back. But yeah. Obviously, the youngsters don't want to come and listen to this. A lot of people turn up. We got about 45, 50 people turned up with all the stuff on. We had a fantastic night. Everybody said it was a great night. I thought, I don't know, I've had enough of this. I'm not young anymore. Um, I'm not going to do it anymore. So I'll put it out that that's my last effort at that. We've been, I've been doing it for about 10 years, running music and bands. and mm. uh, So anyway, a young woman in the village took it on last year. So... And it was quite a success. They'd done it in a different way, mm-hmm. uh, totally different way. Packed the hall out with youngsters. Fine. It works. Great. That's and we can go and enjoy it. We, got, we can just go and enjoy it. We haven't got to do anything. And that's one of the joys of going to somebody else's gig. <laughs> if Dalton was a dessert, what would it be? I mean, obviously, I like sticky toffee pudding, so I'd probably say that. Or apple pie and cream. Yeah. Oh, that's a great shout. Yeah, that's what it would be, I think. Mean. Yeah. Any particular reason? Or it's just what comes to your mind? Yeah, because it's a, an apple pie and cream village, I think. Yeah. Of course. <laughs> <laughs> Naturally. Because <laughs> we do do cream. You know, we have teas, cream teas. Yes. That's another thing we do, coffee mornings and mm. thing every week. Yeah, I suppose, yeah. I, I don't have a particular reason, but I think it would fit nicely with Dalton. I mean, that's my favourite dessert, so I think that's an yeah. excellent choice. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Mm. Years ago, there was um, a government direction came around to all remote communities about forming an emergency committee in 1977. I don't know if he was born then. Uh, Dalton was completely snowed in above the hedges. It was that deep snow. It was completely Mm. cut off. So this was in the event of something like that when nobody in the community could get out and because of the main services, fire, wherever they are, couldn't get in but was dealing with bigger communities that you'd be self-sufficient. So we formed a committee like that. Mm. And it's never been wanted. Nobody ever thought we'd ever need it. But now we do. After you know. all that time? Yeah, after all yeah. that time, we never had to use it. And I mean, obviously, a lot of the people in the village have changed for various reasons. They've moved or died or whatever, who had 
various skills or a four wheel drive car or a chainsaw or whatever it is, or if the electricity was all off, they'd have a Rayburn that was on solid fuel. You can go and get hot water and that sort of thing. Mm. That's it all designated. All the little streets in Dolan had a community officer, if you like, but we'd never had to use it until now. So there is like this thing, but because we didn't have Facebook in them days, now you've got Facebook, people communicate much easier. Back in the day, one of the things we ought to have, in case it snowed, we hardly get any snow here. We had a little bit here and there after that big one in 1977. But with the new emergency committee, so we ought to buy some snow shovels, do a, get a job lot and sell them out to all the people. So that's what we did. Yeah. Which was great insurance because we haven't had snow since. <laughs> <laughs> all the shovels yeah everybody's got a snow shovel somewhere but uh, haven't had to use them i suppose one of our little legendary people then is a guy who was called cyril dumbleton okay. right he was, he was, when he was a hundred years old he's which he passed on now when he was a hundred years old maybe five to ten years ago he was an ex-policeman in S sussex he got a special award for, bit for service and everything. They wanted to award him this special award. So he had to go back to Guildford to get it. I, I knew he was doing this. And I went up the store one day and uh, they said, oh, how did Cyril do on his trip? I said, what trip? He said, oh, when he was going up to get his um, service award from the police in Guildford. He said, oh, we know what he's doing because he went up there to buy a wind-up alarm clock. Why did he do that? Because at 100, he was driving to Guildford. He wanted to stop on the way somewhere in a lay-by, have a sleep, put his alarm clock on so he won't go <laughs> Wow. <laughs> he'd done the same coming back. Did he? And he'd been with the same insurance company for 71 years, I think it was, and they had to give him a free year, you know. I would hope so. But it was a sort of sad ending to that, and that was the funny part. I'm, a little, a year or two afterwards, me, Jean and me was driving up the road in the car towards Dalton Beacon, up the our way out the village. I saw this car all over the place. So it eventually stopped before he got up to the top in the sort of little lay-by. And I saw who it was. So I pulled in and went back. I said, you all right, Cyril? You know, um, he said, no. He said, I, I, I've just bought this car. He said, and they didn't show me all the controls. And the front screen was completely misted up. He didn't know how to change gear. He couldn't drive it properly. So I sorted it all out for him. I said, look, get your chair here and do this and do that and this is that. And then I drove off. I thought, I don't want to see if it goes any further. What sure. could happen? But within months after that, he was going down towards credit and then the police stopped him and they took his licence away because he mm. just got, you know, he'd lost it and he'd gone beyond it. But he had a happy time. He lived in a little bungalow just off the square in Dalton. Him and his wife, she died quite a few years before and I had to go in there, another little plumbing job to do some work in there. And I walked him around, and they used to have these little fluffy terrier dogs. And I looked him around and said, there's one there as a doorstop. All the dogs they'd had, they'd had stuffed and used them as doorstops. Oh, my gosh. That's a bit <laughs> <Quite> creepy. <laughs> <laughs> How many dogs were there? Oh, about three in there, I think, yeah. Oh, yeah. well, I guess it must have made them happy to still see their yeah. dogs around. <laughs> Most people bury them. <laughs> <laughs> has there been a time when a member of your community has surprised you? What surprised me? Yeah. Personally? Yeah. <sighs> Probably lots of times, I should think. But a generosity. Um... Yeah, and they're appreciating what you do for them and their love. Yes, um, I can't name anybody particularly, but little things you've done and it comes back to you in mm -hmm. a big way. I appreciate what you do. Hence, our wedding was such a lovely success with a village event because Jean and me both, she loves it here, get involved in lots of stuff and uh, it is appreciated. Amazing. Oh, well, thank you so much for sharing all these incredible stories. I'll just pause the recording.
We checked in on Eddie recently. He's well, and glad they had some rain at last in Dalton. Since our chat, he's been reminiscing about the Dalton Carnival. We hope it comes back in full swing soon, Eddie. He said he knows his kids would love to hear this podcast, so if you're Eddie's kids and you're listening now, hello. We hope you enjoyed the stories as much as we did. You have been listening to Stories from the Sticks by Scratchworks Theatre Company. We'd like to say a massive thank you to Eddie for being an incredible guinea pig for our new creative venture. And thanks to Beeford Rural Touring, without which we wouldn't have met Eddie. If you want to keep in touch with all things Scratchworks, we're on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and you can sign up to our mailing list via our website, www.scratchworkstheatre.com. This podcast was edited by Andrew Armfield and the music was composed by Jack Dean. The pilot was commissioned by Exeter Northcott's The Time Is Now project and supported by Arts Council England. And episode two of Stories from the Sticks will be coming very soon. Thank you.